Welcome to another edition of Currently in Quincy. I'm Joe Catalano. Today we will learn all about the criminal justice program at Quincy College. Two instructors will be joining us shortly. First though, as always, we take a look at the weather and the news for you. Currently in Quincy, some sunshine out there. It's a pleasant 47 degrees. We're looking at partly sunny highs in the low to perhaps mid 50s this afternoon. And not as cold tonight as it has been the past few nights. Lows tonight will drop only into the upper 30s. Sets us up for a pretty mild weekend. Sun and clouds tomorrow. Again, up around 50 degrees. A little warmer on Sunday with increasing cloudiness. High Sunday in the mid 50s. I think the rain will hold off until Sunday night when showers move in. That turns into a pretty stormy Monday. It'll be windy, warm, and wet on Monday. Look at highs on Monday in the lower 60s. Looks like it's going to rain all day on Monday and then dry out and cool off for the rest of next week. Again, sunshine, 47 degrees in Quincy right now. Checking out news for you today, Quincy Mayor Thomas Koch says the city is already complying with a state law that requires a certain amount of multifamily housing around MBTA stations. The city council is considering a proposal to create a new multifamily overlay district in areas around the Quincy Adams and North Quincy MBTA stations. The mayor says Quincy is way ahead of the game. The T, the T has been the state, in conjunction with the T, is, is pushing these districts and a lot of communities that haven't stepped up to do any development, particularly for the housing crisis that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as we, we go, we're, we're one of the top producers of housing in the state, so it's not as much of a big deal for us because we're already doing these things, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Uh, this specifies, uh, is it specifies the area, I believe, off the of Quincy Adams and Center Street and some of that area. In fact, we, we, there's already a proposal that's improved on Center Street. So I don't think it changes much for Quincy, quite honestly, Joe. Ward 4 City Councilor James Devine says he's working to protect residential areas around the Quincy Adams T Station from overdevelopment. The City Council will review the proposed overlay district at a meeting Monday at 6.30 at City Hall. A third recreational marijuana shop will be opening in Quincy soon. The Zoning Board of Appeals this week unanimously approved of what will be called Chill and Bliss to open up at the site of a former Burger King restaurant and bank on Quincy Avenue at the East and West Howard Street intersection. Brian Wall, who also owns a pot shop in Halifax, said his proposal will not only clean up a blighted vacant building, but that He'll also work to be a good community partner. In the city of Quincy, we would, you know, want to reach out, obviously, to the police department to see if they have any drug prevention um, programs for the youth that we could sponsor and have our staff, um, you know, be there, handing out information, educating the thing. You know, we'll work with school systems um, again on drug prevention, drug education. Um, you know, with you know, the FDA limiting it. There's been more research coming out of the institutions. For the longest time, Harvard and Stanford couldn't do any marijuana research because they would lose all their federal funding. But that's being lapsed now that the VA's doing a lot around marijuana for veterans. So, you know, as more research comes out, we'd like to share that research with the, with the city and the school departments and, you know, do education if there's nonprofits that have any, you know, it doesn't have to be drug awareness. It could be, um, you know, anger management, anything to help promote the kids could be youth movement, you know, athletic programs. So we'll be out there helping the city, you know, you know, if approved, we'll be out networking with all the different organizations across the city and leadership in, within the city to find out, you know, what organizations could use both manpower support and financial support. Some residents did express concerns about traffic and some young children being exposed to the new shop. The new shop will employ up to 20 workers and be open 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. The board did ask Wall to implement a right turn only into and out of the shop onto Quincy Avenue. Three people are facing charges of being in a stolen U-Haul containing stolen merchandise and a handgun in Quincy. 
Police stopped the U-Haul in the Walmart parking lot on Monday afternoon after determining it had been stolen in Brookline last month. After an investigation, officers recovered stolen purses and electronics in the vehicle, along with a loaded 25 caliber handgun with an obliterated serial number. Facing charges, 33-year-old John Mosby of Dorchester, 44-year-old Caitlin Atwood of Cohasset, and 35-year-old Tiffany De Silva from Dorchester. De Silva was taken to the hospital for a pre-existing medical condition. She'll be in court at a later date. All three are facing charges, including possession of a stolen vehicle and merchandise and firearms violations. Police were still working to determine the owner of the stolen goods. 214 sea turtles have been treated so far this season at the New England Aquarium Sea Turtle Hospital at the Quincy Shipyard. Each fall and winter, hundreds of endangered turtles become stranded on Cape Cod beaches as the water cools and the turtles become trapped in the hook of the Cape. Volunteers with the Mass Audubon Society in Wellfleet patrol the beaches and then rescue the turtles that include Kemp's Ridley, Green, and Loggerhead Sea Turtles. Hospital staff treat the turtles for dehydration, malnutrition, and pneumonia. Once the turtles are stabilized, they're transported by more volunteers to rehab facilities in the south, then released into the warmer ocean waters there. It's our check of news for you today. Coming up, we learn more about the criminal justice program offered at Quincy College. That's next. Hello, and welcome to the fifth Revolutionary Minute. This video series from Quincy Historical Society, Quincy 400, and QATV aims to honor and celebrate the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, recognizing events both significant and obscure here in Quincy, Massachusetts, and beyond. On this day, 250 years ago, December 5, 1773, Abigail Adams wrote to her friend and fellow patriot, Mercy Otis Warren. The tea, that baneful weed, is arrived. Great and, I hope, effectual opposition has been made to the landing of it. The infamous tea had indeed begun to arrive in Boston on November 28th, after weeks of anticipation and protest. Today, it is widely understood that the controversy over this tea ultimately sparked the American Revolution. But why tea, of all things, to be that spark? For the answer, we must look to the cultural and economic history of tea in the British Empire. Tea was first introduced to Britain from China in the 1580s. Its popularity increased over the next two centuries, eventually becoming widely available to the average consumer by the mid-1700s. It would be hard to overstate tea's importance to British and colonial society. One contemporary magazine went so far as to say that tea was a necessary of life. This was partially due to the realities of life. Waterborne illnesses were common, and people often avoided drinking plain water if they could opting instead to have a hearty mug of beer, hard cider, or rum punch. But obviously, drinking alcohol every hour of the day is not an ideal practice, so beverages such as coffee, hot chocolate, and tea became welcome substitutes. Tea's caffeine content also contributed to its necessity. Before 1773, boycotts of tea in the colonies were largely unsuccessful due to tea's habit-forming properties as a stimulant. After all, many Americans today would balk at the prospect of going a single morning without a cup, or three, of coffee. Furthermore, the American colonists were eager to keep up with the Joneses of British high society, and taking tea was a cheap way to do so. Smugglers also could make a fortune importing tea from outside of the British East India Company's monopoly. It is estimated that of the 300,000 pounds of tea consumed annually in New England, three quarters of it was imported illegally. When Parliament passed the Tea Act in the spring of 1773, those smugglers stood to lose significant profits, as legal tea was now so heavily subsidized that it undercut their prices. To the Patriots, the Act used tea's appeal and addictiveness to finally establish Parliament's authority to tax the colonies without their consent. Abigail Adams summed up the seriousness of the situation thus. You will find that the proceedings of our citizens have been united, spirited, and firm. 
The flame is kindled, and like lightning, it catches from soul to soul. Great will be the devastation if not timely quenched, or allayed by some more lenient measures. Abigail correctly recognized the extent of the trouble brewing. Trouble that would boil over in just a few days' time. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll join us for the next Revolutionary Minute. Welcome back. By the way, tomorrow is the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. There's going to be a special program at the Thomas Crane Library in Quincy Center tomorrow at 2 p.m. to check that out. Time to focus now on the criminal justice program over at Quincy College. Every month we try and feature a different program or opportunity available at the college, and this month it's all about criminal justice. We have two instructors from the program to talk to us today, so please welcome Jason Pinich and Sue Tebow. Great to see you both. Thank you for having Thank you. us. Thank yeah. you for having us here. Pleasure, yeah. It's, uh, the college I know, um, Sue is very well known for its criminal justice program um, and its nursing program. You have been involved uh, for several years now, right? That's correct. So I, I've been with the college for approximately 14 years. Wow. I started with uh, Jason on a criminal justice advisory committee and then I um, progressed to being an evening instructor as an adjunct for the evening students. And then most recently, um, 20, about two years ago after COVID, I uh, took a full-time position in the department. Wow, so tell us a bit about your, uh, your background before Quincy College. So I am a retired uh, corrections official. I um, worked or served for the Massachusetts Department of Corrections for 34 years. Wow. I started as a correction officer in 1986 at MCI Framingham, and then progressed my way through the ranks to ending my career as a superintendent in the department. Okay, um, so how do you think that experience prepared you for your current role at Quincy College? Well, um, like I said, I had served on the Criminal Justice Advisory uh, Committee. Which was um, what, Sue? What was the committee? So the committee, I'll have Jason actually expand sure. a little bit about that. Sure. sure. So the, the, the all of the programs at the schools have an advisory board, and in order to uh, make sure that we are headed in the right direction, have the right types of courses for, okay. the, for the moment, um, we will bring in subject matter experts and professionals from the field and get their input not only on the health of the program, um, but also you know any innovations that we need to work towards or specific objectives you know that uh, uh, that we need to embrace to keep the program current and 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 going in the right direction. Right. So okay. So the college in putting this curriculum together formed this committee to make sure they did it right, basically, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So how long ago was that? We do we do that every year. Oh, you do that every yeah, year. Yeah, that's an ongoing process okay. um, just to maintain the health and um, uh, health and right? relevancy of the program. Yeah, because yeah, I'm sure that the um, criminal justice avenue is changing just like everything else. Changed right? quite a bit. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe so. You can talk a little bit about some of the changes that you have seen. Uh, in the program over that time? So um, I think what we have seen most recently is the changes with the um, initiation of the uh, criminal justice reform mm. um, initiative for the country. And those changes have filtered down obviously into both the um, employment opportunities yeah. and direction of uh, the justice system out on the street, yeah. as well as the curriculum that and the approach to the curriculum, I would say, in the college. Yeah, we had uh, heard a lot, and I'm sure it's true. I know even here in Quincy, uh, a lot of longtime law enforcement officers uh, decided to retire early or maybe change careers, uh, you know, just because of the changes that have happened, uh, not only here in Massachusetts, but but across the country. Are you seeing that manifest itself at the college? Too? Uh, I would say definitely. Really? Definitely. How so? Well, we see that the um, the, I don't want to say the media because we're here with the media, but I think oh, we're not that the media. okay. <laughs> so they, they, I think the kind of the expectation of the um, issues that uh, police officers face mm. on the street and the uh, perspective and the interpretation of such incidents has kind of springboard off and um, has deterred a lot of people from wanting to either go into the field because they don't want to be. Um, accused or have to explain their responses or their actions, um, mostly regarding use of force. 
mm -hmm. that type of thing. Sure. So being in, in the limelight, um, I think has changed people. And then the, the, the job is extremely demanding. Mm. Sure, and people yes. don't want to do that. It's 24 seven, seven days a week shift type of work. Yes, yeah, and it's it's not only the individual, but it's their families as well, right? That's correct. Yeah, it's it's almost like being uh, a military personnel you know, stationed correct. overseas, sure. So, Jason, let's hear a little bit about your, your story, your background uh, leading you up to this current sure. role. Sure, I, um, so if, if you noticed, I enunciate my R's, which means I'm not from here. <laughs> not from here. Uh, not from here, right, as, as are many people. Uh, so I am uh, grew up in Montana. Oh. And, um, I had a career prior to coming to the criminal justice system, but uh, I, I was looking for some kind of a career opportunity um, where I could give back a little bit, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, help out my community, right? So, sort of an altruistic spirit. In Montana? In Montana. Okay. So I uh, engaged in a, a law enforcement career. This was back in about 96. Um, so you were a police officer? So I was a police officer okay. in Montana. And um, I wanted to go into the federal system, mm -hmm. and uh, that requires a four-year degree or military background. Um, so I left left the police department, went for a four-year degree in another state, and uh, eventually got married and came out to uh, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, same as Sue, mm -hmm. uh, did some adjunct work while I was here, mm -hmm. um, and. The opportunity came open at Quincy College, and so I've been there for about 14 years now. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, has it been fulfilling for you? Has it been rewarding since what you hoped to achieve? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it is a great way to, um, I think, uh, guide individuals going into the field mm. and, uh, you know, hopefully um, helps help set them straight as mm -hmm. to you know what the field is about and uh, you know what people expect you know the idea of constitutional policing and you know, we hear a lot today about you know social justice yep. um, those are themes that have always been in policing right and so um, it's been a, it's been a great pleasure to work there um, we have a we have a very great at Quincy College we have a very great relationship with Curry College so we are able to see our students matriculate from a two-year program into a four-year program mm. and kind of watch them blossom you know towards their career goals right. um, and this is a great place to do that so can we talk a little bit about the actual program itself um, at Quincy College uh, if, if a student enrolls in criminal justice uh, what is the curriculum what what is it that they learn yeah so we have we have, uh, of course, the uh, the college um, college core right classes, but it, within the criminal justice department, we have a core curriculum: um, criminal law, uh, uh, intro to criminal justice, criminology, juvenile delinquency, criminal procedure, courses like that. They're foundational courses, okay. right, to to go forward. Okay. And then, of course, we have a set of electives that students take. So some students come in; they want to be in an enforcement type of role, right? So we have electives that are geared towards um, you know, line level patrol work okay. uh, in, in policing. Um, we also have electives for the students who want to be more human services oriented, right? Um, quite, a, quite a few of our people, uh, you know, they want to get into rehabilitation uh, or things of that nature, okay. right? Um, so, so there's, students can begin to, to shape their career from the very beginning that they, that they enter into the college, yep. right? Um, yeah. So and they can follow, it sounds like two tracks they could follow, basically, right? Generally speaking, those are kind of the two, two tracks that are, that are in there. Okay. Um, some students want to find that they are very interested in law, mm. and so they kind of start looking towards uh, the legal profession, and mm. of course the college has the paralegal program um, um, that, that serves that community as well. So mm -hmm. they, you know, we, we blend those classes within the, within the elective system. I see. Okay. Um, and then we have that we have a, a three plus one articulation agreement with Curry College where uh, the students um, can progress through our program and again matriculate into Curry and finish up over there. Finish with a bachelor's. With a bachelor's degree, at the end yes. of that. But for students who graduate from the Quincy College program, it, it would be an associate's? Uh, it would be an associate degree. In science, I'm guessing? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What would they be uh, qualified or prepared to do right out of Quincy College? So if they're if that's they're going if that's where they're going to stop, yep. they'll, they'll the majority of them will go um, uh, towards a policing career. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Sue, let me tell, tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about your uh, your course offerings and your curriculum. So, you, so you're coming at it from a different perspective, so right? Jason and I work together. We teach this teach the same courses. Okay. So on that um, graduation with that degree, so for p <coughs> positions like any other uh, any other discipline within criminal justice, so you have the policing, you have the courts, and then you have corrections. Corrections, right? There's yeah. a lot of financial uh, advantages to getting the degree. So they bait for most of them in Massachusetts, their union contracts would have a uh, clause that if they did have a degree, got a degree, in addition to have an opportunity for that degree to be paid for, mm -hmm. um, the employee would get a financial benefit um, um, in their salary, which mm -hmm. would be included long term in their retirement. Oh, okay. So okay. it's it's an incentive. Yes. It's an incentive to get your education. Yeah. So are there um, opportunities in, you know, corrections? Uh, so is there a need for that right now? So, um, as Jason said, so the, the criminal justice isn't just about the law enforcement. So those students who are interested in other, other aspects of that criminal justice field yeah. who may want to go into the rehabilitation, reentry type yeah. of things, yeah. there's tons of opportunities. Right? Yeah. We also try to st not steer the student, but marry them up <coughs> with other uh, departments at um, Quincy College, mm -hmm. this is the psychology department, mm -hmm. the sociology mm -hmm. department, human services, so they can, uh, there's a lots of jobs in criminal justice, okay. so if they're pursuing even, let's say they're pursuing a degree in psychology and they're looking to be mental health and mental health clinicians, yes. The field is welcoming, yes. welcoming that. The here are the clients, if you would. They're yes. the same yes. personnel, but now what they are, they're captured in the system. So they're in the criminal justice system okay. now. Okay, so it's very specific. It's very targeted, very specialized type yes. of, um, of education yes. for that particular line of yes. work. Yes, yeah. you, you either want to work outside of the field, kind of, I would say, outside of working and uh, as far as a student goes, with yeah. that type of focus on the rehabilitation rehabilitation, reentry again, and or they want to work within the system. Yep. So yep. they want to work outside the system or they want to get uh, work where they're more involved people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you kind of talk about the typical student in the, in the program? Are they are there younger students? Are they coming from s certain backgrounds? Uh, so we, are there more so we men have than women? Or is it just we kind of have a diversity in okay. the sense that we have a very robust online program. Oh, and really? I think we were oh. one of the first colleges in Massachusetts to have our a criminal justice program online. Hmm, okay. And so that audience appears to be that working student, yes. that student that is getting their degree for that incentive, yep. that enhancement in their salary. So they're working in the field. They tend to be a lot older. Hmm. Um, there is veterans involved is as right? well. And um, that's primarily our online student. Okay. Would you say that? Would you agree to that? Yeah, I think that would be the, certainly the majority. Okay. Right? okay. Uh, we do have you know traditional students who go into the online program as well for mm -hmm. various reasons. You know, work, you know, childcare, things of that nature. Um, it allows a lot of flexibility. Mm. You know, in 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 the life course, um, we have uh, a pretty robust um, relationship with the Quincy High Schools oh. and some other some other schools. Um, where they're doing dual enrollment programs, yes, sure, so yeah. so those those more traditional students are coming up. Um, we participate in this in this uh, activity called the Early College High School yes, uh, yeah. program as well, right? To yeah, kind we of, about kind that of on the prime show those individuals. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, we have you know veterans. In, so you you may if you come to a to a classroom, you may may have a traditional college uh, traditional college student who right just graduated high from high yeah. school, okay. um, as well as a working professional sitting right next to them who you know maybe has been uh, you know, on the job, as they say, yes. uh, for some number of years, right? Um, as well as a, just a returning adult who is maybe seeking a different career or some kind of retraining, things of that nature. Yeah. So it's a pretty good blend okay. in right. the classroom. Like Sue, Jason, have you seen, uh, <coughs> I guess, uh, folks questioning more about getting into law enforcement uh, than years past because of, you know, the police reform bills and different changes that have taken place sure. in the profession? There's so there's you know there's there's always more interest or you know there's a cyclical nature to to social interest in criminal justice right and certainly the criminal justice system 
in, in society um, has sort of a cyclic life lifespan, right? Mm. There's there's times when criminal justice is on the top, and it's it's very um, appreciated and celebrated, mm. and then there's the time you know when it's not, mm. right? And th and that has happened you know throughout history, you know, over and over again, okay. right? Um, but there is a baseline altruism, right? People, first of all, you need you need you need professionals in the criminal justice field. That field isn't going away. It's not, you know, it's not going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. <laughs> you're you're going to need that, right? Yeah. But the individuals who come into our program really um, are motivated by a sense of altruism, right? Similar to myself. They want a, a career where they're, they're doing good. They mm -hmm. want a career where they give back. Mm -hmm. And those individuals never go away, yeah. right? So there's, there's always a baseline interest. Uh, some years we have a little bit more, some years okay. we have a little bit right. less. Um, but that baseline interest is always there. Yeah, And it sounds like, too, through the program at Quincy College, <coughs> coming in with that baseline interest, they can choose. They can kind of pick and choose which direction they want to go in, you know, law enforcement, um, yeah. Absolutely. corrections. Uh, and, and you'll see the student, you know, as they as they mature in the program yeah. and as they become more aware of the variety of different jobs and roles and you know what fits them the best you know you'll see them come in with one with one target yeah. and then you know it'll change you know from time to time sure. right and they'll change into a different a different uh, target track if right? you a different will track. Yeah. Um, how has technology uh, impacted the way criminal justice is taught um, either at Quincy College or in general Certainly. So we so from a from an educational perspective, yes. you know, technology has has changed the game immensely. Really? Right. We have um, not only the in-house technology that we do, you know, learning management systems and things to just facilitate the learning uh, a little more smoothly, um, but we also you know have the ability to bring in all these uh, different outside tools that students would use um, to help them as a student, but also to broaden their perspectives. Right. Um, Certainly, you know the the publishers that we use. You know there is a, you know, really um, progressive um, materials that the, that the students simulation can simulation software. Simulation. So simulate. Simulate. Yeah. Where the, st the student can go down a path and mm -hmm. be exposed to a real life scenario and have to make quick decisions. Yes. And based on their decision making skills, yep. they would be, the, you know, the publisher's resource of the simulation would prompt them to say, okay, you did this. Well, the, you know, this is the consequences of that. Okay. And this is the con. Right. It doesn't mean it's wrong. Right. It just means, okay, that's okay. You're good. You made a decision, but this is what happens along that way. These yes. are the things that could happen. So we, we can't quite put them, you know, in a patrol car, Obviously, but we can certainly, right. you know, Show give them, them what a flavor like, of that right. experience, yeah. Yeah. Right? like a flight simulator kind right. of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. flight simulator. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Exactly or that. in a correctional setting as well, right? right? To, exactly. to experience that as well. We, yeah. we tend to do like to bring our students to out and get experience. So we right? do tours. So we. Last year, we went over to the um, juvenile court in Denham, mm -hmm. so we sure. sat in the class in, in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. We've gone to Plymouth County uh, House of Corrections. Yep. Jason was frequent uh, flyer at uh, the many correctional institutions, state institutions that okay. I worked at. So we try to make that connection and also expose the student to the system in a real life manner so, so they, they can, can see really what see is it. actually yeah. happening. So it was all fascinating, that, yeah. You know, we're, we're able to provide education for students in, in any in any form that they want it and right. need it, right? It's no longer you have to drive to the college and be there, you know, at these certain yeah. times and oh geez, my, my job won't allow that, right? The, the various technologies that we have and embrace c can give a first class education. Sure. You know, at two o'clock in the morning. Right, right, right on their schedule. <laughs> on yeah, their schedule. Exactly. Yeah, it yeah. works out great. So thank you both. I really enjoyed learning about the program and learning about your backgrounds. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You're very welcome. Thanks. Just enough time to check the forecast for you for the rest of the day today. Get out and enjoy. It's nice, sunny, uh, up around 50 degrees or so this afternoon. Still pretty good tomorrow, too, with the uh, highs right around 50. The wet weather will hold off till Sunday night. Monday looks like a complete washout.
Thanks again to Jason Pinich <laughs> and Sue Tebow for joining us. Thanks to our crew. Thank you for watching. Speaking of Monday here in the program, folks from the Quincy Art Association stopping by. Meantime, head to our website. It's qatv.org. All of our latest programs are there. News and information, video on demand, live streaming, and more. For all of us QATV, I'm Joe Catalano. Have a great weekend.